Great. Thanks, Fernando. Uh, hi, everyone. Um, my name is Jocelyn Tomkinson, and I'm really excited to be here today to tell you a little bit more about the Rick Hansen Institute, uh, who I work for. And uh, thanks to SCIBC for inviting me to come. Um, oh, sorry. There we go. <laughs> you have to go to the arrow on the bottom right. There we go. So um, who am I? This is a picture of my desk, um, and it sort of encapsulates who I think I am. Um, I consider myself a curious, opinionated science nerd. And um, my job, as I view it, is to be curious. Um, my background is in cell biology and in public health. And, um, and also, I have done a lot of work in patient advocacy. Um, I was born with a tumor on my spine, which effectively caused a spinal cord injury before birth. So I've been dealing with this my whole life. Um, and I grew up uh, at BC Children's Hospital, basically. And so I've um, had a lot of experience working with uh, young people as the youth advocate um, and working on better transition care for young people um, with uh, chronic and life-limiting conditions. And um, that and then I've facilitated a lot of research as a research assistant and a research manager. So that's what took me to where I am now. So here's where I am now. Um, for the last two years, I've worked at the Blessing Spinal Cord Center um, for two organizations. Um, i -Cord, which you may know about, which is UBC's Spinal Cord Injury Research Center, and um, also for the Rick Hansen Institute. At i -Cord, I help researchers uh, develop funding proposals to fund their research and get research grants, and also to uh, tell stories about our research so that people in our community, like you, uh, know more about us and about the great work we do. At the Rick Hansen Institute, um, I've been asked to create something called the Consumer Engagement Strategy, which is essentially to get consumers, people with spinal cord injury and the people who support them, more involved in research and to hear their voices better in the work that we do at the Rick Hansen Institute. So I'm going to tell you a bit more about RHI and then a little bit about our consumer engagement strategy. And I hope to hear a whole lot more about, um, about your questions and uh, research priorities, the things that, uh, that you really care about, and answer any questions you might have. So, so I probably don't have to tell anyone um, in this webinar about spinal cord injury. Um, I think most of us have either lived it or helped people who live with it um, for a long time. Um, uh, that's for another session. Another session, OK. Um, <laughs> We're going a little backwards here. Yeah. The, the, the take home message of this slide, this is a slide that hangs in a large form poster in our office. Um, mm -hmm. The take home message is that SCI is not that common. It's not that prevalent in Canada, but it's very, very expensive. Some researchers say that it's um, the most profound injury you can sustain and still survive, um, both uh, the cost to the person and their family um, and also the cost to the healthcare system. Um, so I kind of went, jumped the gun, but so, yeah. Sorry. Go back? Yep. So the, uh, what I want to, show you is that that's the reason why we're all here together. It's not just to help people with STI, but because spinal cord injury is costly, um, it has enormous impact, and it affects the whole country, not just the people with spinal cord injury. Um, so you can uh, see this is a bit of a too detailed um, image, but it's on uh, the Rick Hansen Institute page under who we are. Um, and um, this shows how Rick Hansen Foundation and i and in the early 2000s um, uh, worked together to create, oh, I've got a pointer here. Um, mm -hmm. So there was funding from the um, federal government that created the, where is it, Translational Research Network, um, and RHF formed the Solutions Alliance um, with existing com community support organizations all across the country. Um, and then became this Spinal Cord Injury Solutions Network. And then in 2010, um, the name was changed to the Rick Hansen Institute. Um, sometimes that creates confusion, but um, 
the Rakenson Institute and the Rakenson Foundation are actually separate organizations um, that have different boards and different missions um, and different roles, which I'll also explain. And you can view this um, image more closely on the website. Uh, oh. the arrow. There we go. Uh, so today, uh, the Rakenson Institute's vision is a big one, a world without paralysis after SCI. Um, that's a pretty ambitious vision, I think we all can agree. Um, but I think all of our spinal cord injury organizations that are working together uh, would agree that that's really what we hope for. Um, I just want to draw your eye down to the last point under our mission, um, which also includes that we want to improve the quality of life and health care available to people with spinal cord injury. So we're not just hanging in for cure only. We, we also want to make sure that the lives we live um, now for people with spinal cord injury are as good as they can be. And you'll be touching on those points here. Yes, a bit. absolutely. Um, so two other points in our mission were to lead collaboration across the global SCI community. And this is one of the areas where we at RHI feel that we um, have a unique role to play. Um, because we aren't um, academic researchers, we aren't only a community, not only, but mm -hmm. we aren't mm -hmm. a, a community service organization, we aren't strictly fundraisers. Um, we're sort of occupying a middle role and we want to have the opportunity to bring researchers and clinicians especially together mm -hmm. um, to work in all together toward solutions for spinal cord injury. Um, can, we, can we just expand a little point that you mentioned? You, sure. um, you said we're, that we're not fundraisers. Are you going to talk about that? Yes, I am. Okay. That's the next slide. Okay. Um, and the last piece of our mission I didn't mention is to identify, develop, validate, and accelerate the translation of evidence and best practices. So some of these are buzzwords, but mm -hmm. um, what I want to say is that you'll hear a term called translational research in this presentation. What that means is um, taking an innovation in research, a new idea, um, a new therapy, or a new pill, um, from idea to application in the real world as fast as we can. Um, and I'll touch on why that's a problem, why it's been difficult, um, but that's one area where um, RHI has been working to, to accelerate is in this translational research right. area. And just to make sure that people also understand that translational research is not just about the cure, right? Right. There's, oh, yeah. There's a lot more to it. Exactly. It's all about knowledge, procedures, policy, all mm -hmm. of you know it's a little bit of everything. Yeah. We could be saying here, we, we want to accelerate the cure for spinal cord injury, but mm -hmm. we're not. Because mm -hmm. translational research is about getting innovations. So it could be um, a robotic exoskeleton, a better wheelchair, um, a better way to care for patients in the hospital. Mm -hmm. um, but it's difficult sometimes to get those innovations, those bright ideas, into application in the real world. Um, and so that translational research process um, is what we're trying to accelerate right. at RHI, and that could, that's care, it's cure, um, and as our other mission statement says, it's also facilitating collaboration to make that happen. So don't worry, I'm going to try and explain that better. So here um, is my goofy little graphic about roles. So um, in, in any disease or health condition community, um, cancer, multiple sclerosis, brain injury, there's a community of organizations around the people who have that condition. Um, and in spinal cord injury, uh, we have a big community um, around a relatively small population of people with SCI. Um, so we have, let's see if it, oh, it went backwards, oops. Just go back That's okay, I'm oh, fine. Um, so, you have on your screen uh, five bubbles. The, the green bubble is probably the most familiar to you. Um, these are the healthcare organizations. This is Vancouver Hospital um, or Glenrose, um, Toronto Rehab. These are where you get care directly from a doctor, or nurse, or physio. Um, community services organizations are like SCIBC or the SCI organizations all across the country. Um, but where it gets a little confusing is up here in the research mm -hmm. side. So uh, i -Cord is an academic spinal cord injury research center. And um, what academic means is that it's affiliated with a university. It means that the researchers themselves are faculty members who teach at universities. They educate graduate students and undergrads. Um, and they're, they're faculty members in certain departments. They're following science in 
orthopedics or in physiotherapy or in neurosurgery or biology. Um, and so they often have to, uh, they're measured by their peers in peer-reviewed journal articles in a whole world that most of us don't know much about. Um, they have to compete for funding from grants and they have to um, follow their sort of academic departmental procedures and their main goal is to be independent investigators of the science that's in front of them. Um, I'm sure every i researcher would also say that they, um, that they also work really hard to hear directly from people with spinal cord injury, to inform their work so that they're doing work that's useful and has an application in the real world right. to clinicians or patients. Um, so where RHI fits here is in non-academic research and application. So researchers don't have to be in universities. They can be um, in nonprofit groups like RHI. Should I stop for a minute? No, it's okay. We can okay. Find, the filter down there. Um, so there are other organizations like um, like RHI and the Paralyzed Veterans of America is a, a similar type of organization. And one of the things that, one of the roles that these organizations like RHI play, hi, is uh, trying to uh, move research forward while maintaining um, a priority on spinal cord injury. Uh, academic researchers have to follow the science in front of them and because of their funding or the peer review or, or the route that their science takes them, they may stray away from spinal cord injury. But a nonprofit organization can set their own priority and say, we're going to facilitate research in this area because this is what's important to us. And who sets those prior? At RHI, RHI, we have a board and we have a translational research, research advisory committee called a TRAC. Mm -hmm. um, and there are people with spinal cord injury on those boards. Um, uh, we're also influenced by our consumers, so people with spinal cord injury. Also, our stakeholders, which right. would be... Um, clinicians generally, um, people working to care for people with SCI all across the country, what they need mm -hmm. to get, do better care, and also our funding stakeholders um, who are usually the federal government. Um, and because it's federal government and health, um, and health budgets that are contributing money, um, one of their biggest priorities is seeing the costs of health care reduced. And so they uh, want to help RHI achieve our goals to accelerate research for spinal cord injury with this, the parallel goal of reducing costs. Right. So for the consumers, is there a feedback process? I think? Absolutely, and that's okay. the consumer engagement strategy. Wow. No, we, we actually didn't practice this before. No, we didn't. <laughs> <laughs> but you're, asking, you're yeah. feeding me all the good questions. Yeah. Yeah. This is perfect. Um, so uh, the nonprofit organizations, um, that role is, for example, the Rick Hansen Foundation. Um, nonprofits often do fundraising and raising awareness uh, about the issue that's important to them, mm -hmm. like spinal cord injury. Um, and the Rick Hansen Foundation is also uh, an organization that allows Rick himself to reach out on areas that are, he's really passionate about, and um, spinal cord injury is the main one. Um, and there's a lot of overlap between these organizations. Um, we all try really hard to work together so that um, our efforts uh, turn out better health, uh, better quality of life, mm -hmm. um, and a more accessible, inclusive world for people with SCI. Um, but just to let you know, the differences between the roles are usually have to do with funding and how priorities are set. Um, and hopefully at the end of today, I will be able to show you how you can help us set our priorities. So. Okay, so how RHI works. Um, so if you can imagine the, uh, the pathway from an innovation, this little light bulb here, from an idea mm -hmm. about SCI care or quality of life or um, a, a cure therapy, surgical procedure, any new idea for SCI, um, and the route that it must take to get to its application in the real world. So, for example, if it was a new um, a vitamin that you could take that improves your skin health so you didn't get pressure ulcers. Um, 
we, a researcher might identify that in his lab or her lab, um, but it takes years, sometimes 20 years, to get that into everyday use um, at the patient's own bedside or in mm -hmm. your own home. Yeah. Can you just um, talk to us why it takes that long? Yeah, absolutely. Here, I'll, I'm going to skip ahead and I'll go back. Remind me to go back to this. Okay. So why accelerate research? Um, so I adapted this from a really smart guy in um, Philadelphia who uh, did a graph, this little mountainous graph here. If you imagine that this way, the horizontal axis here, is the movement from an innovation to practical application. Um, and if you imagine up the vertical axis, um, that speed or productivity. So, um, so here we are, basic biomedical research. This is where most research happens. This is where they're trying to develop new drugs. Um, clinical science and knowledge is where they test those drugs on people, um, develop new practices. And then here at the end is health decision making and clinical practice, so where it's actually used. But in the middle, there are these valleys. There's two valleys, one there and one there. And sometimes they're very dramatically called the valleys of death. And what that means is, that these are the areas where typically new ideas and innovations get stuck. Um, right. As they move from their first germ of a new idea to application, um, yeah. often in the basic biomedical research area, they get stuck uh, because they, they use up all their funding and it hasn't been tested in humans yet, so they can't get another round of funding. If it's a um, a new startup or a company that's testing a new product, um, they might run out of funding in order to get regulatory approval. Um, they might need uh, operation. Yeah, to make it they, bigger, sorry. That'd be great. Um, so up here, I added these gears. And these gears are the supports and infrastructure that the Rickhansen Institute offers to try and accelerate research from innovation to practice. One is funding. Um, RHI offers some funding to um, facilitate, to help other researchers who are already working on areas of interest to us um, to help them do that research. Um, operations is support where we work with clinicians, for example, who are already caring for people in their offices, and we don't want to take them away mm -hmm. from those offices. So we are offering to help them do their project through research assistant and um, through uh, infrastructure like computing and um, informatics. We take that in-house mm -hmm. and conduct that research for them and with them. Now, is that just um, for the Lower Mainland? Or oh, no, it's all across Canada. And okay. we actually are partners with um, uh, research sites and clinical units in mm -hmm. Israel, Australia, I think China. Um, and are looking to build our network, but th we generally provide our infrastructure and supports to Canadian organizations um, and researchers, uh, except one thing, which uh, is our global research platform, which falls under this gear here, the informatics area. Informatics is it's sort of a fancy word for um, uh, software and uh, tools that help you make the best use of data, and that's um, such as our registry. We have the Rickhansen Spinal Cord Injury Registry, which is started by Marcel Dvorak at VGH. And um, RHI's work to spread it all across the country, encapsulating all of um, the main SCI acute care sites and rehab sites all across the country. And when I say sites, I mean hospital units. Mm -hmm. And um, the goal of that is to collect as much information about individuals who sustain a spinal cord injury um, what their experience in the hospital is like, what procedures they have, what type of injury they had, and their outcomes, which are how they do after their injury. So, um, you know, how many complications they have, the time they spend in the hospital, the, uh, uh, the level they, of their injury after they're discharged versus the level of their injury when they sustain the injury. So um, that's called a registry of patient data, mm -hmm. and it's incredibly powerful to researchers who are doing uh, studies for clinical trials, um, drug efficacy, um, and just wanting to know what the experiences um, and uh, challenges of our population of 
people with SCI across the country is. We're offering the software that that registry lives in to other sites around the world, Israel, China, Australia, and others, um, so that they can host their own registries in this so software. And it's carefully protected so that um, none of the data gets um, accidentally shared. It's all anonymized so that it can be used for publication. And it's a really powerful tool that's very hard for individual researchers to do alone. So it's a resource that we offer to researchers all around the world so we can all do better research together mm -hmm. on SCI. Um, the other aspect here, um, we use the term champion change. And what we mean about that is um, that once we've come up with a great new idea and or a great practice, we, um, we want to make sure it gets used in everyday life. So we've created um, tools like our Actionable Nuggets, um, which is a program for family doctors to it's sort of a crash course in caring for someone with SCI. Um, and so we've created tools that promote the best practices, the best ways to care for people with SCI. And um, we're working together with all of our sites and partners to get those tools used mm -hmm. by your doctors, by you, by, um, by emergency room physicians, for example. Um, and, and those are the ways that we're trying to move research from the left side of your screen to the right side, from research to application. So it's a bit of a complicated yeah. side. <laughs> How's the uh, registry working? Like, is it, Has it been populated? Yep. Um, we have, I should put the registry page up here, but the Rick Hansen registry has a page on the Rick Hansen Institute, uh, org site. Mm -hmm. And um, I believe it's 3,900 uh, people mm -hmm. are part of the registry, and those are Canadians. Um, and those are people who volunteered to put their information in and signed a consent yep. form and all that yep. good stuff. Um, and they're being followed as they uh, go into the community, as their path from acute care to community um, continues. Uh, they're also starting registries in other uh, organizations, other countries, that they're hosting on our GRP, your global research platform. Right. The registry itself is is expanding to um, go in other directions, like to help um, spinal cord injury hospital units um, measure their success, the mm -hmm. success of their patients and the, the quality of their care over the previous year. So right. we're trying to use that information to help mm -hmm. improve healthcare as it goes along. Um, as you know, as we implement better practices and standards for better health care in Canada. I know it sounds boring, but um, if, if you're admitted to a hospital with an injury in Halifax versus Edmonton versus Vancouver, you want to make sure that you have the access to the best care possible and right. the same level of care as everyone else would receive. And so um, this allows us to measure that, but it also allows us to take sort of a snapshot of how everything's doing and identify where the system could be adapted or improved. So, so who's responsible for, you know, after a person signs up for the registry, all that other information, who inputs that information in there in terms of medically related information? There's, um, each site has a, a registry site lead. So it's someone who already works in that hospital unit, okay. sometimes nurses or physios who RHI um, supports a part of their uh, time right. so that they can recruit and okay. um, input data into the registry. Um, and then sites that are participating um, can decide how they share their information, whether they share just the demographics or whether they share all of it. Um, and then uh, they decide as a group, as a group of researchers who use the registry, how they're going to publish that information. Okay. So um, I'm just going to hop right back. Yeah, so you're going to go back. Um, so I've told you a bit about our five gears. These are the, the five uh, supports or pieces of infrastructure, the tools that we use at RHI to try and move spinal cord injury mm -hmm. research along. Now, on the top, if you look at on the top here, I keep pointing. I should use the cursor. Um, uh, people out there can't see the cursor. Okay. So, 
the arrow that's on the top. Do you want me to point? No, that's okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, we have uh, cure, commercialization, and care. Commercialization, um, I should tell you, is our word for um, facilitating a new product idea, for example, a wheelchair, um, to move from someone's bright idea on a workbench to being the wheels that you mm -hmm. use to wheel around um, faster. So commercialization is how we get a great idea into the marketplace right. to be sold and used. Um, Do you have any a, examples of that? Um, not there. Most of our examples are currently underway, okay. so I can't really talk about that. But I can talk about oh, a famous stuff. example okay. that was one of the reasons why we we want to help with commercialization. And one of those is a lot of people have heard about the iBot, which mm -hmm. was a wheelchair that um, was invented several years ago by the inventor of the Segway. And the iBot was a self-balancing gyroscopic wheelchair that had a standing confirmation it could go down stairs. Yeah, yeah, so you know, it was yeah, pretty amazing. Mm -hmm. And um, uh, if you've ever seen one in person, you'll want it right away. It seems like the neatest thing. Um, unfortunately, um, the iBot fell prey to some of these valleys. That's kind of why they call them valleys of death. The iBot got around here. And it had been developed as a product. People were using it. But they couldn't get it through the US uh, regulations. Um. And they ran out oh, of money because okay. the millions of dollars okay. it would have cost to get it to consumers to buy it as a product was so onerous that they simply couldn't afford yeah. to to go the last mile in commercialization. And usually what um, companies do when they're developing a product like that is they look for investors, angel investors or um, people who, if you've ever watched Dragon's Den, they take a mm -hmm. piece of equity in exchange for supporting the product. Um, Maybe they should have gone on Dragon's Den. Yeah. Well, there has been wheelchairs on Dragon's Den, too. I think um, really? Jeff Adams had one. Yeah. Oh. Um, it's, a, it's a pretty tough valley, though, because you have to have enough of a market in order to get investors to pay for, to support your product. And so one of the things that RHI is doing is having sort of a speed dating for investors with um, developers. So um, recently in Boston, they had a big investors forum and invited um, uh, corporate investors and angel investors and um, companies that were developing products of use to people with SCI right. and trying to make good matches there so that we can attract funding and investment in those products. Mm -hmm. um, in that particular example, I mean, could it have been that the unit itself was cost prohibitive also? Cause I think that was a big part of it because it, it, you know, it was a power wheelchair, mm -hmm. a new kind of power wheelchair with um, its market would be even smaller, I think, than the general SCI population. So it, that's a, a tough, um, it's a tough one to, to get gain investment for. Mm -hmm. um, but it just means that the threshold for yeah. for success is, is a lot higher and the technology is a bit newer. I mean, the Segway itself didn't do terribly well either. Mm -hmm. So um, so we're all about trying to lower the threshold to try and move that idea along. But we have a really rigorous um, uh, protocol for examining whether it's a relevant product to people with SCI. And we're actually currently looking for people with SCI who will help us um, apply that to new ideas and proposals that are being made so that we make sure that your uh, priorities, our priorities yes. with people with SCI, um, our sort of front and center as we choose what to support mm -hmm. and what to develop would or to help develop. The exoskeletons in there. Um, the exoskeletons <laughs> are actually doing quite well yeah. on their own, okay. um, and so because one of them is being developed through the Neuro Recovery Network, and one of the other ones is seemingly fairly independent in its uh, funding. I'm not sure of the that details. The um, the that's Israeli. Exo is the independent one, and then Rewalk is the oh, Neuro Rewalk. Recovery Network one. Um, but uh, we were approached by another company at one point, um, and I think there's a lot of interest in that area, but they also have to sort of have a certain need mm -hmm. that we can support, and I think our biggest goal is trying to match make between investors right. and products. So, um, oh, Okay, so the last piece about this is you might notice, so these are our three, or there's four programs. Under, um, that RHI has. We have cure, care, commercialization, 
And there's also consumer engagement, but you might notice it's not on this diagram. Um, the more I thought about it, the more I realized that consumer engagement is this whole circle. The circle from innovation to application and then back to innovation. Um, we, we at RHI don't just want to have a consumer engagement program. We want to have that, the, our organization have the mindset of engaging people with SCI in what we do, um, in hearing their priorities, in ha having their input on um, the tools that we offer, as well as the programs that we're conducting. And um, some people might know the term knowledge translation, which is just a fancy term for making sure that research um, is, becomes relevant to the people who benefit from it. Um, and the important thing about knowledge translation in research is that the consumer, the person who benefits from that research, um, should be included, integrated in the process of that research. And so that's why for consumer engagement, we're shooting for an organization that truly engages consumers in, in what we do, in right. the process of down here on the bottom, in mm -hmm. the user or the consumer informing the in research that we're doing, so giving that feedback on what our needs are to the researchers, to the product developers, and then being a part of um, supporting, um, choosing, informing the research that we're doing to take it from innovation to application. Um, just quickly, CURE is uh, hopefully self-explanatory, but it's um, definitely in the translational research side, but there's, as we said, there's that aspect of both cure and care. But cure research is supporting researchers who are doing basic science and applied science um, on therapies that restore function. Right. And um, it may not be just one, one huge cure that fixes everybody. It, it's likely to be individual or incremental cures. Um, but the, the goal of our cure program is to support using these infrastructure and tool support um, to move ahead research that restores function for people with SCI. And the care side is um, helping uh, improve health care for people with SCI, helping improve standards for it, and ensuring um, the knowledge, the things we do know about SCI get applied to health care. So that um, that's the whole quality of life yep. side. And, uh, for those that are interested more about the cure, uh, a number of months ago we did a, a webinar with Wolfram. Dr. Right, Wolfram I watched Tesla. that one. So um, if you're interested in hearing more about that one, just go to our YouTube <coughs> channel and you can find that session and it has a lot of detail about that. It so does, yeah. It's titled uh, The State of Research in, the in Canada? Canada. I think so, yeah. yeah. So. And um, it's a really good summary. I think Wolf also wrote a paper on the stem cell cure innovations and that sort of thing. Um, so that's a that's a good place to start, mm -hmm. definitely. Um, so um, goals, we've talked about a lot of these things, but in the next five years, we're hoping to, uh, we're goal, our goals are to improve and standardize delivery, so the care you get in Halifax is the same mm -hmm. as the care you get in Alberta, um, to create an international cure strategy by connecting um, a global network of SCI researchers. Um, specifically around clinical trials. So uh, there are only a few uh, trials of therapies happening in humans right now for SCI. And one of the obstacles that has been identified um, by most researchers and clinicians is that it's really tough to truly collaborate. So um, our goal in the next five years is to try and um, help a network of researchers collaborate with the goal of um, increasing clinical trials. And, a stra and creating a strategy on cure. Um, also to expand access to data and informatics support for SCI researchers and clinicians, and that's our registry and global research platform. Um, that goal is more to make sure that more people can use it. Um, and a greater number of innovations brought to market, which is the commercialization um, program that I mentioned. Mm -hmm. um, okay, so I usually glaze over when I see org charts like this. Oops. Um, but the, the take home message here is see, we have these four programs I told you about. Um, but down here. You can expand it by going to full screen on the very top. I have to actually look at my paper. So I can read it. 
There we go. It's just a linear. Stuff. Yeah. So um, translational research, again, it's not just cure. It's also in care. Um, and translational research is helping researchers move it from innovation to application. Um, a piece of translational research um, is best practices implementation. Sorry, that got cut off. Um, and that means once we know a practice is the best, is the standard, um, is working with clinicians and patients and educators to integrate that new practice into um, education and practice. So for example, if we discovered that being turned like a log roll every five minutes was absolutely essential while you were in the hospital, um, it would take years for everybody to do it. So once we know it and we publish a best practice tool, right. um, we also want to um, use our networks to make sure that it's being used everywhere and that all new students in nursing and uh, family practice and acute care know that that's the standard. So, um, so informatics, I've mentioned, it's, um, we also include uh, health economics, so looking at how different interventions to improve the healthcare system are save us money or are the best place to uh, improve first, because there's a lot of improvement yep. to be made. Um, network development is all about collaboration, mm -hmm. creating networks to get research into application faster. Wow, we had trouble with this one. <laughs> this one's best <laughs> and brightest. And uh, this strategy is all about coming alongside um, academic researchers and funding uh, positions so that we can recruit faculty to focus on spinal cord injury. So um, researchers can, you know, they can look at topics. If they research neurons, they can look at brain disease. They can look at peripheral nerve disease. They can look at um, spinal cord injury. But we want to make sure that that we're facilitating, we're helping those who want to work on spinal cord injury. We're attracting the best and brightest to research in this area. And it also supports graduate student training. Um, strategy six, which I've mentioned, is the specifically the consumer engagement strategy, which I'm just getting to. Um, but the, the overall message here is that we have these programs, but our strategies often draw from more than one program, more than one area, for example, cure and care. Um, we just want to uh, sort of mention that we work with a lot of different funding partners, including SCI organizations all across the country, um, the national and provincial chapters up there, um, <coughs> research organizations, nonprofits, academic organizations, pro provincial governments have been um, great funders as well, and um, uh, we really appreciate their support and we couldn't do it without them, um, and we strive wherever we can to work with who's doing the best in that area and province. So, so my question for people here in the room and um, out there on the interwebs is, um, have you ever searched for research information on spinal cord injury, and if so, what, what were you looking for? So I wanted to talk about how um, people with spinal cord injury and RHI can work together, mm -hmm. and in generally about consumer engagement and research. So some of the reasons why it's important to have consumers, and again, that's people with spinal cord injury and the people who support them, so family members, but I also consider um, service organizations, mm -hmm. um, people like Fernando, who, um, who need to have that familiarity with research, um, because you probably get a lot of questions about that sort of yep. thing. Um, so as I mentioned, relative to other conditions, SCI is pretty rare and each injury is really different. Um, and so it's, it's vitally important that the, as many people as are comfortable and healthy enough to participate in research do. Um, you know, what we would hate to have happen is if we had a, a great new innovation for um, uh, therapies for, or functional recovery treatments for SCI and couldn't get the number of people we needed to test whether it was valid or to, to demonstrate what, um, what effect it has. And that's particularly important because um, most uh, functional recovery therapies have um, intensive physiotherapy involved in them, which is, you know, most people have had access to and it's kind of tough to keep people in studies for that long. So, um, so 
first of all, getting people to participate in research is a big goal. It's a big reason we have our consumer engagement um, program to begin with. Can, um, I, uh, can I ask a question about that? Because, sure, sure. Um, you know, there's the, the term um, saturation is, you know, yeah. been put out there, especially over the last few years. Because of our population, yeah. it is small. You know, it, mm -hmm. it's not compared to some of the other disability groups. Uh, cancer, for example, you know. Right. Um, so do you want to just chat about that? Yeah, absolutely. Um, what that means basically is um, take, for example, uh, GF Strong is a rehab hospital here in BC, and it um, even though it's the main rehab center for all SCI in all of the province, um, it's pretty small. Mm -hmm. And researchers at GF Strong struggle sometimes to make sure that their research projects are not overlapping. If they're testing something um, and then their research subject, uh, their participant participates in a different research project that is also testing, they, they may confound each other's research projects. And we also, um, end up with sort of research fatigue, pretty mm -hmm. much everybody at some point goes, no, that's enough. I just don't have the time. Um, so it's a really important and difficult thing that researchers are dealing with. And there are some ways to, to deal with it, to overcome it, and some ways that RHI is using. The registry, for example, is a really great way to do that because it allows us to um, grab from other regions grab data from other regions, from other people with SCI that are not in our um, catchment area, or not where that researcher is, and even you know, over in Australia um, to use for a research study so that all the data can be kept in one spot. Um, and another is uh, encouraging researchers to collaborate and providing them with the tools to do so. And what that does is uh, avoids duplication and hopefully allows us to combine studies um, so that there are fewer of them and less fatigue, less saturation. So is there a process put in place to help with that? I mean, um, you know, because uh, you mentioned GF Strong, for example. GF Strong has a bulletin board um, so down one of the halls, right? And it's you look at the research projects that are going on, they're all very important ones, but sometimes you just have to ask yourself, or, or I ask myself, was there any communication between the PhD students or the researchers as, you know. Yeah, and then that's a great example of how the priorities of people with SCI are often different than those of the researchers, those of the graduate students, mm -hmm. or of the clinicians. Um, there are processes being put in place, and I know that um, GF Strong researchers are working as part of i to come up with a process. RHI itself doesn't specifically have one, but one of the tools that we're working on is, um, and it will come probably in the next four years, mm -hmm. which would be um, a clinical research uh, tool. Uh, if you've ever seen Michael J. Fox's website, he has yeah. something called the Fox Trial Finder. And we think it's fantastic. Mm -hmm. And um, there's a lot of clinical research being done in SCI. And we think by helping people with an online tool to sign up and indicate the research that they're interested in participating, right. we will be able to facilitate researchers all across the country, um, even internationally, in matching with the, the uh, patients, the people with SCI, who really want to participate in those studies or are open mm -hmm. to participating in anything. Yep. So yep. That, that's coming in the future, and okay. we're hoping, we're definitely considering that saturation is an issue, and we don't want to promote you know, large-scale participation in research without considering that. Um, and I know that some clinical units already have mm -hmm. um, a sort of triage system to prevent people from being sort of okay. a double research. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and, but it is definitely something to consider. And I always encourage consumers um, to consider what's important to them, what, what really matters to you in terms of your highest priority for recovery or uh, quality of life or stability, mm -hmm. and support the researchers that, that are doing that. Um, if, if you're generally available and you just want to be um, a keen research participant, you can participate in anything you want, but you will almost always be asked if you're participating in something else. So um, it is something to consider. Thanks. Um, so I just mentioned yeah. age, like there's a couple of research done at UBC about diabetes and that happens too. So there's a cutoff of age, and I was really frustrated because I was interested in doing it, but I was too old. And I don't really understand that. The question was, um, 
why is age a factor in participating in some research? Um, researchers have to sort of draw a frame around um, who fits into their projects. It's called exclusion and inclusion criteria. And those criteria have to do in part with who might be negatively impacted by participating, um, who may have um, aspects to their condition that exclude them, uh, that make them less relevant for what's being studied. So for example, if someone was studying the effects of um, alcohol use, recreational alcohol use um, and partying behavior among young people with diabetes, they probably would exclude people who are older because it doesn't fit conceptually with the research question. Sometimes it has to do with risk. Um, researchers always have to um, have their research vetted by an ethics committee. And the ethics committees ask of the researchers and of themselves, um, is the risk higher than the potential benefit? Um, and they can't risk harming anyone. So it, it might simply be that it's just better to exclude certain categories. So but then like seniors it may be, but there's, you raise a good point because recently in the last sort of five or ten years we've realized that for example most pharmaceuticals are tested on men and never on women mm -hmm. and that began to raise um, an issue because they were never truly understanding the impact of heart disease on women for example mm -hmm. and so um, researchers are now being asked by their funders um, uh, you know by government agencies that fund research to consider whether they are including the populations they should include and conversely whether they're excluding the populations that um, that should be included. So it's a really good point and I encourage you when you see a, pro a project you want to participate in to mention that if you're excluded. Oh, yeah, yeah. That's good. That's really good and it's part of being informed and, and actively engaged. Um, and hopefully that's something that over time can be um, fixed as well. Yeah. Um, Okie doke. So, uh, consumer, so consumer informed research is more likely to create results that are relevant to you. Um, so for example, we've talked about priorities. So some people are really keen on cure research. Some people are really keen on secondary complications. Mm -hmm. But if, if researchers are doing projects with no input from consumers, they may be solving a problem that's not a problem or not a relevant problem. Mm -hmm. So having your voice heard and from RHI's perspective creating places so you can have your voices heard um, makes a big difference in terms of the, the quality of the output from our perspective. Mm -hmm. Can I just back up to uh, Barbara's point there? Um, talking about our, our aging population. I'll just I, Barbara and I would go back a long way, so I can make, <laughs> I can, I can make these little jokes between us. But, you know, fact of life is that there are a lot of our members and um, people with spinal cords who are aging, moving into those later years. So, and, you know, we've talked about quality of life issues also. Yeah. So, is there, can you share a little bit about that? Is there anything that's, um, being discussed from the research side of it to tackle that because yeah. a lot of the ones. Okay, sorry. Yeah. Um, I can tell you of one researcher whose project I helped at i um, I I don't know exactly where the project is right now, but it's a project that has to do with um, a functional recovery in older adults with spinal cord injuries. And that's not necessarily the aging process, but it looks at um, and it looks at if they're injured as older adults, oh, okay. but also there are two other researchers that I know of that have a big research group that looks at the aging process, um, and in not just with SCI, but I think also um, in other forms of neurotrauma. So there are definitely researchers who are looking at that, and I can tell you that aging is a huge priority for research funders. So okay. there's definitely incentives. And uh, who are those researchers? Yeah. Um, I'm not a, I'm not sure if I'm allowed to okay. say oh, because we, yeah, yeah, I, and yeah. the reason is that I helped with I their tried. their confidential applications and I don't know what stage they're at so and yeah. I'm just keep you know stay tuned on the iCord website because okay. we announce who gets funds so um, that one might. you know researchers <laughs> are also competitive oh, so I, I have to be careful <laughs> yeah. um, so encourages as Barbara said. Um, being involved in research encourages researchers to continue sharing their results 
um, back with you in ways that benefit you. And so lately, as knowledge translation, that buzzword I mentioned, um, has become more important and more popular, um, researchers are now being asked to uh, demonstrate how they're going to communicate the results of their research. So more often you'll see um, at the end of a survey you participate in, um, if you want to share your email address and they'll email you the, the results of the survey, you know, de-identified, sort of anonymous, um, back with you. And I've participated in several projects lately that sent me a nice newsletter. Um, and increasingly we're trying to do that. Um, mm -hmm. Unfortunately, or fortunately, um, researchers are often like small businesses. They're like independent small businesses with a few employees. And um, unless they have a, an institute like i or um, Robarts as well in Ontario, um, and to a certain degree RHI as well, um, to, to sort of put those skills together to communicate that work, that research back, um, they don't always have the capacity to do it because it's, it would be an unfunded project. Um, so bringing it back to the consumer engagement strategy, um, one of the main areas that we're trying to um, bring consumers and researchers closer um, is to uh, support, through some funding, um, events and uh, tools or uh, resources uh, that bring the latest research news back to the consumer. So, for example, an email newsletter that updates you on um, finished research projects. And um, we're hoping to provide funding so that whenever we have meetings or seminars among the academics that we have a session that's consumer focused so that mm -hmm. we can invite our community of people with spinal cord injury to come and um, hear what's happened, but in a way that um, is both ethical, you know, it's not results that haven't been published yet, um, but is also understandable and accessible for everybody. Yeah. So we're definitely working on that, and that's a good point. Because a lot of people think that researchers aren't very personable. I know, and they're you know... They're in this dark room, and they're doing all this complicated <laughs> stuff, and their people skills aren't that great. It's really funny. I'm going to make so buttons that say, hug a researcher. <laughs> Um, so, skipping ahead, um, promotes inf more informed consumers. Uh, there's some research that uh, also says that um, patients who are involved in research tend to be more informed about their own condition, mm -hmm. um, and demand for it creates demand for clinicians themselves, your doctors, our doctors, to become more informed about spinal cord injury. Um, because we often find that, especially people who are really uh, actively uh, supporting functional recovery, they tend to advocate among their own physicians for the support and knowledge yeah. about it. Um, and I think that's a really important thing because doctors have a lot of difficulty keeping up with the latest. So There must be a couple apps out there though. Uh, there are, <laughs> but you know, it would be nice if they had like um, apps like Zite, you know, mm -hmm. where you can read yeah. things you're interested in, but where patients can send them to their doctor. Right, right. <laughs> I don't think that's yeah. going to happen, but it would be nice if you could share that that sort of information. And I know there are some organizations that are looking to um, create uh, resources that are shared with communities of um, uh, like physiatrists, rehab doctors, and uh, other clinicians so that they can say, hey, look what's, what's coming up that we're interested in and create a, a sort of easily accessible bite-sized product, certain nuggets, um, so they can help them learn. So um, I can't remember why I had that slide, <laughs> so I'm going to skip it. Um, so I, here's a question. Um, I want to talk a little bit about priorities. So if everyone who can type, everyone who can, who's involved, tell me your, let's just try the, the number one function that you think are the highest priorities for recovery among people with SCI. So not necessarily yourself, but if you had to guess about the number one priority for recovery among people with SCI in Canada, what would it be? What do you think it is? Only recovery or an issue? Um, we'll say an issue. We'll be a bit more broad in mm -hmm. an issue that you think people need. So Kirsten says bladder. Um, blood, James, the bladder and bowel. Anyone else? Any other and, thoughts? And pain and just being able to um, try and get back to your former lifestyle. Like I found 
my stamina is just so down at what it used to be. Okay. And I'm not capable of doing as much. So stamina and quality of life. Yeah. Um, so we've had uh, walking, um, regeneration of the core that covers all issues. Underneath that we have pain. So you've, you've covered pretty much the, the gamut of, of the main issues. But I want to share with you, so we just want to consider that we don't all have the same guess, right? right? Mm -hmm. so, so there was a study that you may have already heard about that was done by Kim Anderson, who's now at the Miami Project to Cure Paralysis. And yeah, make it bigger. Um, you might want to full screen this puppy. So what she, she did a, um, a survey, and I think she surveyed about 700 people with spinal cord injury, um, both quads and paras. And what she found was among the quadriplegics, the biggest priority was arm and hand function. Yeah. Um, among paras, sexual function. Mm -hmm. um, and then, but sexual function was number two for quads. And then um, bladder, bowel, and AD, and trunk stability were close second and third. You know, it's important mm -hmm. to consider this because um, I just want to illustrate that there, is it this button? Yes. Um, that we don't all, there's not one consensus on what our priorities are. And I think that that's a really strong case for why consumer engagement is really yeah. important in mm -hmm. research. Because the researchers can't just guess. And more and more often, you know, I, I help researchers with their funding proposals. Um, research funding agencies are asking for the, how well this project is matched with, um, how well the project is matched with uh, the priorities of the consumer. Right. You know, how relevant is this project that you're trying to do to um, the real world? It's a vetting process. It's a vetting process. It's not the only way that they evaluate them, right. but it is one of the ways. They're asking researchers who apply for funds mm -hmm. to consider it. Um, and there are SCI-specific funders, like the Craig H. Nielsen Foundation mm -hmm. and uh, Spinal Research UK, that also consider those. And they have a process within their own organizations to prioritize certain types of research that they fund. So. Um, Consumer engagement is in part about learning. I can send the paper out too. Um, uh, it's, if you look it up, it's under um, Kim Anderson, and it's from 2006, I believe. I'll just write it down here. Um, and I can send a link around too, if people want. Why would Paris be arm and hand function when they, they should really have that? Quad, quads are, well, arm and hand function was a very small amount. so. Yeah. Um, it could have to do with the type of injury they had, or maybe they're just like just barely quad. Well, they're not strong enough, maybe. To yeah, perhaps. Um, I know a lot of people have shoulder pain, so they may mm -hmm. have um, included yeah, that. Yeah, because that just means you're probably unfit. And yeah. You need to exercise more and strengthen them. Well, it, there are a lot of concerns with shoulder and joint issues, mm -hmm. and and that may be what they considered. I'm not 100% sure if that was included in that area, but it's a good point. Um, Barbara noticed that arm and hand function was included on the paraplegic uh, scale. So, um, okay. So we'll move along. Um, so, um, just illustrating that we don't all have the same priorities, but the priorities are a really important part of engaging consumers in research. So RHI's consumer engagement strategy is about engaging people in the research process as participants, but also to provide input as consumers and as beneficiaries of the work that we do um, by improving awareness of SCI research, knowledge, and value, and enhancing opportunities for people with SCI to make evidence-based health decisions. And that's essentially giving them the knowledge about SCI research so that it can be relevant to their own decision making. Mm -hmm. um, an important thing that for people to know about research is that um, researchers uh, share their research with other uh, scientists through journal articles. Mm -hmm. And that process allows them to compare and to test that work and see whether it's valid and safe and all that stuff. And that's a very long process. Publication, publications go back and forth. You might publish three or four journal articles on a given project. And then there's feedback that's given. Um, so it's important to remember that if you learn of a research project before it's come to its conclusion or before it's been peer-reviewed, 
it might not yet be relevant. It might not yet be tested. And it's really important to us that um, as researchers that we don't want to share information before we know it's been tested and it's reliable. Mm -hmm. um, so I know some people have concerns that researchers <coughs> are too uh, closed up, that they don't share their work enough, um, or that they people get upset that they can't go to research conferences. In part, that's because we want to keep people safe from research we're not 100% sure is ready for sharing yet. Um, but we believe at RHI that there are ways that we can help researchers share information generally about their work um, that can help people. If they did. Exactly. Mm -hmm. And and it might um, help consumers who are learning about that research um, take a more active role mm -hmm. in research and be um, and, and use the general knowledge about it um, to their benefit. For example, we don't yet know whether weight supported walking is truly helpful. But we know that participating in physical activity is essential. And so um, learning more about how walking improves circulation and all that stuff um, often informs people about how they can be more active in ways that aren't just walking, right. um, in ways that can help their bodies. So, um, so that's a summary. The three key areas of our strategy. So this is what Recanson Institute is doing on research. Um, or on uh, consumer engagement. The first is we want to create a go-to resource. So like the first place you'd look um, on healthcare and opportunities to maximize recovery after injury. So um, I know Rick has told me that two of the biggest questions he gets um, from when he visits people in acute care after their injury are, um, am, am I getting, am I doing everything I could do? Mm -hmm. Are the doctors doing everything they could do to help me in the hospital? Um, and also, if I had, if I raised twenty thousand dollars, what could I spend it on that would give me the best chance for recovery? Mm -hmm. um, and there's a lot of good information out there, and there's some research evidence, but we found that there isn't a single resource on it. So that's what we're looking to do. Um, are we reaching the end almost? Um, so. The second is we want to improve opportunities to engage in, to learn and benefit from SCI research. And that goes back, Barbara, to that point about sharing research knowledge back with consumers. We want to support in opportunities like seminars, um, Café Scientifique is something we do locally, um, and um, resources like email newsletters, that sort of thing, that will put consumers in more immediate touch with the research that's happening. It helps them to network if they can go to a meeting or something. Yeah. There's a bunch of people. Absolutely. In the same boat. I think it really helps. Um, so the third is to inform RHI activities through a consumer advisory board. So remember we talked about how our priorities aren't all the same, but how vitally important it is that the priorities of consumers um, have a voice and that they influence the work that researchers do. Well, at um, RHI, we're creating a consumer advisory board. And it's loosely modeled after the Arthritis Research Center of Canada's uh, consumer advisory board. And um, we want to ensure that it's, um, I'm just going to, can I yes. just click forward just really briefly. Um, and, oh, yeah, so one more. Can you click ahead one more? Uh, OK, so it's loosely based on Arthritis Research Center. Um, our biggest value here with the Consumer Advisory Board is we want to make sure that it includes a diversity of opinions and experiences. So we have a lot of really great people with SEI, consumers who've supported RHI's work all along, been on the track committee, they've been on our board. Um, and we are so thankful for their involvement. But with the CAB, our view is a little different. We want to make sure that we're including people who are passionate about cure, passionate about functional recovery, passionate about quality of life, people who are quads and paras, people who, who walk and don't walk, people who live in cities and live outside the city, so that we can have a group that has a, a really broad, diverse experience and um, can help us influence the different projects that we do to provide their input and feedback, but also um, to play really specific, tangible roles, like to be um, a consumer representative on our cure committee or on our care committee, which is where all the clinicians and researchers sort of get together and make decisions about what the project's going to do next. 
Um, and it provides a sort of opportunity to advocate for what the group thinks is the most important or to, uh, to vet proposals, that sort of thing. So they're really tangible jobs, not just a, a meeting, you know, every once in a while getting together. I'm just going to click forward. Fernando's having a nice conversation online. Um, so I just to let you know where the consumer advisory or the consumer engagement strategy is at in winter 2014, so it's coming up to March. Um, we are waiting for some funding still, um, but once we get our funding, our, our goal is that we want to uh, help draft a terms of reference for the Consumer Advisory Board saying you know, how they integrate with uh, the Rakansan Institute, how they connect with all the other boards and projects that we do, um, and really sort of putting that on paper so that it doesn't change, we don't get lost along the way. Um, and recruiting the initial pilot members, because we'll be looking to recruit probably four or five people at first and then expand in future years. Um, and then identifying and reviewing content for our resource and for our research participation tool um, so that we have, for example, um, a good list of uh, the research centers across the country and you know, how they advertise their research projects that you can participate in. Um, and then to take the next step, um, in future years to put it in a, a, a recruitment tool online. Um, and then identifying and reviewing content to answer those key questions that people tend to have for Rick, which are about, am I getting the healthcare that I need? And uh, what could I do to maximize my opportunities for recovery? And um, we'll be creating sort of a short list of opportunities and events um, to hold for consumers so that they can learn more about research. And that's, a lot of this is looking at existing opportunities, so um, conferences that are already available and making them more accessible to consumers. So it's uh, ambitious, but we're hoping that'll be in the next, uh, probably the next four to six months. Um, so just some examples of some great things that have happened when people with SCI have been involved in, the, in conducting uh, research project. If you can't click on this, um, if you're watching it later, you can just type the bit.ly link into your browser um, and see what these look like. Um, if you haven't seen it already, Spinal Cord Injury University is an amazing resource. Um, it's a learning tool involving videos done by people with SCI about um, skills and experiences, things that you need. Basically, it's boot camp. Yep. Um, and it was created by um, a guy with SCI and uh, named John Shepard and also with clinicians and it's a really amazing resource and you know I've been in a chair my whole life and I learned something from it so um, the other one is the uh, SCI community survey which I'm sure a lot of people here have been involved in or have uh, participated in um, and consumers were involved in in sort of setting up and conducting the project, but we couldn't have actually done the survey without people with SCI. And the knowledge that it's given us is really, really important for how services are going to be offered in the future. So uh, do we need to break for the chat window? No. Okay. No, well, I'll, um, we'll probably save that question for the end here. Okay. Um, but I'd just like to go and uh, point out about the Healthy Living, the SEIU. It's a it's an impressive resource uh, that I think is underutilized. Yeah. Um, for those that are online um, and for those that will be watching later, definitely go there. There's a lot of great information. The tutorials that are on there, um, I, I just can't say enough about them. So yeah. uh, there's a lot of work that went into per, uh, to creating that, um, and it was done really, really well. A lot of you have uh, or will recognize um, some of the faces on there. Yeah. Um, <laughs> You know, Joanne Smith uh, narrates and uh, stars in almost all of them, I think. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, and she's pretty well respected within our, our community. So mm -hmm. definitely go in if you haven't seen them or if you've just glanced through that website, uh, spend a little bit more time on it. It's a valuable resource. There's lots of great stuff on there. So. That's uh, sci-u.ca. Oh, okay. Yeah. Um, and so the, the URL is up here if you want to type it into your browser later. Um, so as I mentioned, a lot of funders, uh, research funders, continue to emphasize 
um, a close match with consumer priorities. Is the one on the far right? Bottom That's corner. Wings for Life. It's a German um, charity that was set up by, um, what's it called, Red Bull, by the guy who formed Red oh, Bull. Right. That's why it's Wings. Oh, Wings yeah. for Life. Right. And um, most of these, uh, especially Spinal Research and Wings for Life, predominantly fund recovery, cure, functional recovery projects. Right. Um, but they... Um, often incorporate an aspect of sort of a match with consumer interests and needs. Mm -hmm. um, CIHR is Canada's health research funding agency, and they fund all kinds of research, and so it's important for researchers to demonstrate mm -hmm. that the work that they're doing is relevant to a consumer group, or to a, they don't call them consumers, they would call them patient groups, mm -hmm. but um, it's one way that researchers are sort of reminded to consider the needs of and most of them do, I have to say. Um, so, um, it's sort of the end of this section just saying your voice is loud. And we've heard from some folks um, in the chat window, and I want to say mm -hmm. um, that even though priorities are don't always agree, that we don't all have consensus, um, I my work really, the fact that I even have a job doing this is actually the result of um, the loud sort of advocating mm -hmm. voices of people with SCI because um, up until last year, uh, there was no consumer strategy. There was no um, sort of opportunity for consumers to, con you know, general public consumers to connect and to have their voices heard. And, um, and even the CURE program part of uh, RHI's work um, was very, very small until last year, and um, a group of really motivated, active com consumers um, contacted us and said, hey, that's not what we want. We want more on the cure side. Um, we want more attention for things that benefit chronic SCI. And, um, and I have to say, uh, they, their voices were loud and they were very persistent and very well informed. And that resulted in a lot of change and we have to credit them. They mm -hmm. told us what they wanted. Yeah. And it doesn't mean that every time, every organization that you advocate to, that you say, hey, this is what I want, it doesn't mean that they'll always change their directions. But yeah. it's still important that you have your voice heard anyway. Absolutely. And um, you know that a lot of the work that I did um, before I worked for uh, in research was in helping um, younger people gain the skills to advocate for themselves. And I think most adults tend to have some degree of, of skill in that. Um, but I also recommend that people join together with like-minded um, people with SCI, like-minded um, people who have the same experience to say, hey, we care a lot about pain. We want to see researchers um, yep. improving and, and doing uh, more therapies for pain and researching that. Um, and, you know, there's a lot of ways by joining together. You can talk to MLAs. You can talk to um, funders. And um, in the U.S., there's an organization called SCI Sucks. Um, if you Google it, it's SCI Sucks. And it's um, a, a grassroots charity. And, um, and that charity, uh, what it did is uh, basically he does marathons. He races. It's a guy who sustained an injury and then raised some money. Um, and now he gets big groups of people to race in marathons. Because in the US, if you race for charities, then you can get money. And so all the money from racing in those marathons is collected. And um, they, as, they, as a nonprofit group, um, mm -hmm. look at spending it on things that are important to them. And, and um, for example, um, neuroregeneration therapies were really important to him. And so they paid for, I think it's a $50,000 microscope for a researcher in Wisconsin. Um, Wisconsin? It's at Marquette University. I don't remember where it is. But, um, and that's a really, I think it's a great story of how people getting together and um, stating their own um, priorities and being really well informed and working together can influence the priorities of researchers by supporting them in conducting that research. Um, so that's one good example. Do you want to just tackle um, a comment there? <laughs> um, Ruth, I, I've seen some of your um, comments in the chat window, and I'm, I'm really glad that you're here. Um, you know, we, we're not always going to please everybody. Um, we have a lot of consumers who tell us that 
the thing that's most important to them is that they get the best health care possible, that their doctor even knows how to treat someone with SCI. Um, it's not that um, we're saying that cure or functional recovery is not important. I think what we're saying is um, we have a sort of, we're trying to strike a balance of priorities that match with our organizational strengths, but also match with um, what we see as the best opportunities for people with SCI. Um, but by trying to diversify a little, by supporting the best and brightest and recruiting researchers in given areas, by having a cure program at all, um, I think we're trying to um, to strike that balance um, um, amongst the priorities of all of our consumers. Right. I w you know, uh, there's a the last comment by Ruth there, so I'll leave yeah. that one to you. Uh, what does that mean? You're picking all the easy stuff. <laughs> um, I'm laughing not because um, it's trivial, but because you know it's, it's a reasonable comment. Um, mm -hmm. uh, I don't know if any SCI research is easy to tell you the truth, um, but I wonder if a good topic for a future webinar would actually be to have our cure program people come and present because they can give you a bit more detail about it. Yeah, that'd be great. Um, and if you have seen any of mm -hmm. the information about the Blessin Integrated Cures Partnership, that was all created in this last year, and the whole point is to right. um, move researchers all over the world closer to um, cure. I think the thing is that most of the regeneration and functional recovery research is done by basic scientists, and there are, RHI is not a basic science institution. Mm -hmm. So it's not that we don't want to. Um, it's not that we don't want to do it. It's it's that um, everybody has a role to play, and we're trying to help the people excel and accelerate the work they do in the role that they're playing. So. Um, I wish I could give you more specifics, yeah. but um, do stay tuned. Do keep telling us what you um, what's most important to you, and um, and we'll try and do a better job of, um, of spreading the word about how we chose what we chose, why we chose what we chose, and who's been involved in making those decisions. Um, because at the very least, we might not always agree on what we should do um, and where the money should be spent, but. Um, we want to be as accountable and as transparent as possible, and um, we're working on that. So do keep telling us what's important to you. Um, I don't want to go over time, but if we have, is, there, is there any more questions before I <laughs> Dennis will follow up? Actually, just so you know, if you're talking about Dennis Tesla, we've, we're in sort of ongoing conversations with um, him, and, and we went to Working to Walk, which is the Unite to Fight Paralysis conference that happens every year, and it's happening in Seattle this year, or 2014. And it's a, an, I guess I would call it an advocacy group, um, a grassroots advocacy group out of the U.S. Um, that does exactly what I'm talking about here. They got together to fight for the type of research that they, was most important to them, which is regeneration and functional recovery. Mm -hmm. And they're doing a really good job of it. And um, I learned a lot from going there. And um, we're trying to find ways that we can support the work that they're doing and um, and learn from what they're doing on how to do what we do better. So, um, so Ruth, we're trying to listen. So we we hope that you'll hang in and um, and uh, keep us on our toes. So, what do you want from SCI research? So, we're kind of coming to the end. But what I want to say is, we, we saw this slide before. We don't all want the same things. Um, we only have a limited pot of money. Even with all the money that RHI has, um, it doesn't even come close to the type of research money that's available else elsewhere. So we have to make really good decisions about how we use that money. So um, it's really important that um, we hear from consumers the things that are most important in their lives. Um, I hear probably more often that there are needs for equipment grants then I hear about particular concerns about research. Yeah, and so some people can't even afford the equipment they, that would really help them. Exactly. So um, Barbara said affording, um, re affording equipment is, is a really difficult thing for some people. And so um, uh, that's why I think it's important that we have a better sense of what the needs are for the most amount of people or for the, mm -hmm. so that we're not um, picking off the easiest things, but we're tackling the things that are the most relevant, most important. Um, 
On the slide that you have there on that uh, particular study, was the cure one of the questions or was it left out? It was, um, there were six. Well, they, the way they, they posed it was um, the functional activity. So walking was one of them. Okay. Sensation was one of them. Right. Um, right. And so, you know, it, it's a fair point. I don't think that there's been a survey that specifically mentioned types of research, like avenues of research. And there okay. are several that um, could eventually lead to recovery of walking function. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, there's a long way to go on all of them. But we don't want to ignore them because if we ignore yeah. that, then you know, ten years down the road, we're still as far off. Mm -hmm. So, um, so I think I get the sense from this group that the people who are um, are going to, you know, provide their feedback probably have. But if anyone who's listening today um, wants to um, let me know, like if you personally had two hundred fifty thousand dollars to put toward any problem you face. What would you put it toward, and like, how did you, how would you make that decision? That's my question. And I really like this. For me personally, I'm, I, and professionally, I, I need to know this for doing my job. So, um, I know people don't want to do more surveys. They don't want to do more research that doesn't lead right. to a specific outcome. But this, people look to me. Researchers look to me to offer my insight on mm -hmm. what should be studied or mm -hmm. how or what's most important. And this is how I find out, is by talking to people with SCI. Do you want to tackle that now or yeah. put it out there? Yeah, I'm just putting it out there. If someone has an idea or an answer in the room or on the chat window. Um, oh, well. Got any? Uh, yeah, I'm just trying to think. It's hard to pick just one. Just one. Yeah, yeah you have to pick only one. Yeah. Yeah, yeah that's And big. I'm trying to give you a sense of what it's like for a researcher or for an institute. If you have only $250,000, mm -hmm. what are you going to spend it on? Um, you know, some projects are twenty thousand, some are five hundred thousand. There's one project that is part of the Cures Partnership that has to do with um, biomarkers, with the the fluid around the spinal cord right after injury tells us more about the type of injury and thus what we can do to treat it. Right. And it's an incredibly expensive project over you know the period of time that it's going to be done. Um, but it has a real um, huge potential for application in clinical trials and in treatments, like personalizing treatments to specific people. Already, haven't they made strides that people that are injured aren't, they, their end result isn't as bad as it used to be? Yeah, that's, um, that's what we know. I mean, it's certainly mm -hmm. gotten better than it has. The outcomes mm -hmm. are better. Um, when I was in uh, rehab, my roommate had... Um, a cervical injury, she just fell off the bed, broke her neck, and um, and she had no arm function when she came in. And when when I last saw her, which was about a year after her accident, she had dexterity, she had sensation. So she wasn't a complete injury, probably. No, but her surgeon said that, um, or she told me her surgeon said that uh, ten years ago, and she would mm -hmm. she would have been um, yeah. mostly complete. Yeah. yeah. You know, uh, you know what's funny, though? Know? I mean, I knew when I had my abscess in 1990. At that time, they were saying, oh, it's our five, ten years that we do human experiments. I mean, it's been 22 years since my accident, and they're still saying, oh, five, ten years we'll do human experiments. Uh, as far as the cure goes, yeah. you know what I mean? Yeah. So, I mean, it, it doesn't seem to have pro progressed. Uh, well, That's a really good point. point. I think in the hospital, um, you know, in the acute stage, I think there's been more progress. Yeah. Well, but that impression I yeah. Had. As far as severe uh, of injuries, they come up with drugs and, and, and procedures and stuff that have limited. I mean, you don't see as many. Uh, you see a, a lot more people walking away now than you used. To, yeah. Think. I think that you hit, um, I'm just going to repeat what you said just so um, mm -hmm. our group online can hear. Um, I think you hit the nail on the head with a, why a lot of people or some people are dissatisfied with research right now. And I hope Ruth will, will continue to listen because maybe this will strike a chord for her. Um, is that we've heard as people with SCI for probably 20 years now um, that there's a cure right around the corner. And it's so disappointing to get to right around the corner five years later and to see nothing, 
useful or yeah. nothing dramatic nothing happening. Dramatic. So there's two sort of bits of feedback I have on that. One is that um, the more we learn about uh, the nervous system, the more we realize that the cure is going to be incremental, which means mm -hmm. that, you know, one day we might learn, like, Jerry Silver is a really great researcher in the U.S., and he has um, had really great results with a small group of rats and mice on returning bladder yep. function. Crazy and amazing, but it doesn't affect motor, yeah, the motor function like movement. So it's an increment toward functional recovery, yeah. and that's absolutely important, and that's a breakthrough. Nobody's done that before. So, um, so it, it's something that we as a community and science as a whole needs to sort of reset our understanding that this isn't going to be a single project that no. leads to a dramatic recovery. It's going to be working together. A bunch of little things. Yeah, a, a, a lot of smaller or um, pe successful pieces that lead to a dramatic whole. Um, and the other one is that um, I don't think that researchers and the media have done a great job of creating accurate expectations of research. And, you know, I, I know so many people who have been told um, when they were in rehab or in acute care um, by family and friends, um, by the media, by, you know, clinicians around them, oh, yeah, we've got something right around the corner. It's a lot further off than that, but it's not impossible. And the key point is that we have to keep moving toward it. Um, we have to understand that um, just because, for example, Gregoire Courtine, who's um, a Swiss researcher, a couple years ago put out these amazing videos of rats running on a treadmill, running like hind legs only, running mm -hmm. on a treadmill, and it went all over the place um, online and on, you know, on the internet and in papers all over the world. And I saw many, many articles saying that that research would lead to walking in patients within two years. It's two years later, and he's still doing great work, absolutely great work. Um, but he's still working with rats. Yeah. And we, we have advances, and then we roll back a little. We have other advances, and they add toward um, momentum toward cure, momentum toward recovery of um, bladder function and bowel, reduction in pain. And that's something we all have to consider is when we're consuming knowledge about research from the media, we have mm -hmm. to consider Who's making that claim? Is it the researcher in the in the study, or is it the um, guy who writes the headline? Because the headline writer is an editor in some newsroom yeah, who knows not nothing about yeah. SCI. Yeah. I'm not blaming it on the media, but I'm just saying it's important for us as consumers to be um, knowledgeable consumers of media. Um, so, any does anyone have any thoughts on this question, or? Yeah, Being in the wheelchair is nothing really. I mean, I'm not having the bowel bladder is it's the worst. I think. Yeah. So we have um, someone in the room here who said um, being in the wheelchair is really nothing compared to recovering bowel and bladder function. And you know, if you asked me, I'd I'd be torn between restoring bladder function and restoring pain or re reduction in pain, mm -hmm. um, because those are the more immediate things that I deal yeah, with yeah. in my mm -hmm. life, and not that I don't think. Um, recovery is important, but that's what's most immediate to me, right? Yeah, yeah. Am I right to, to think that Rick, uh, not Rick Hampton, um, the fellow from the state, Christopher Reed, yeah. he seemed to be obsessed with a cure and walking. That seemed to be more important to him than anything else. And that's just his priority. Yeah, so but that might have been one of the reasons why he died. Like, I think mm -hmm. he pushed himself. I mean, didn't he have septicemia? Because, because from a pressure right ulcer, there? yeah. So the comment was that um, Christopher Reeve was very focused on a cure and perhaps not focusing as much on, you know, Just living, day, living to day. day to day healthy. Yeah. Um, maybe that caused a problem for him. Maybe that contributed to his death. I think, you know, we can all sus um, That's his choice. suspect and we can all have sort of thoughts about it. But it, at the end of the day, I believe in individual agency. And if that's what he was passionate about, he was willing to bear whatever consequences yeah. come. Then it's more power to him. A lot of good. Absolutely, mm -hmm. the Canadian, uh, Christopher Reeve Foundation is is an amazing group, and um, their neuro recovery network is doing some of the probably most of the functional recovery stuff to do with body weight supported walking and FES. 
Um, and that's a really important uh, route to recovering the walking. The respondent's operating it now, isn't it? Or I don't know. Um, but it's important to just re always remind ourselves that the thing that's the most important to us isn't always the thing that's the most important to everybody else. And then that's not a judgment. It's, um, it usually has to do with the circumstances of their own injury. You know, what is the most immediate difficult need for them? Um, and that it's important. Mm -hmm. So coming back to priorities, um, did you know that there were four-way teeter-totters? I yeah. didn't know that there were. And we have one uh, close to a, well, a playground close to our house. They're awesome. I found this in um, mm -hmm. on Google Images, and I was like, awesome. Well, you can move it around. No, um, no, it, it, it goes, goes all different two directions. That way and yeah. this way, yeah. um, laterally and I don't know, whatever. Um, so here's my great clip art demonstration. But um, it's it's a balance not just among consumer needs and priorities, but also the problems that are the most immediate for clinicians. Um, because those are the most likely to get it sort of immediate attention from clinicians. Um, so the scientific potential, and um, which is the path of least resistance for the researcher, or the path of greatest opportunity. Um, and then also the health system or research funding interests. So, you know, health systems are looking at reducing um, costs and improving outcomes. So fewer infections and less time in hospital. It's not to say they don't want to cure it. And a good point that a lot of people in the cure community have said is that if you are able to cure SCI, then you save the system a whole whack of money later on. Um, and that's something to consider too. But that leads into this question, is that the high risk and high reward work is very costly. And it's very far down the road. So it's tough. You have to consider. What's right in front of you? What are the immediate needs? And what's less reward but a sure thing? Um, and these are all of the aspects that go into deciding um, uh, what research is done and you know, has influenced uh, people with us, or influenced RHI's decision making as well, just as it does any um, clinical and research organization and individual researchers themselves. Um, so I think, I think that's it for me. Um. <laughs> yeah, is um, where is she from? I don't know. Ruth, where are you from? Maybe she'll tell, tell us. Anyway, oh, I had a couple of quick ones. Okay. So be your own activist. I've already talked about this, really. But there are groups out there you can join, Unite to Fight Paralysis, SCIBC, um, and express your opinion about what should be done. And I strongly encourage people to do so. I mean, I yeah. think we've got great examples of how that helps. Um, participate in research you care about. So here's a list of um, ways you can find out about clinical trials to participate in. Um, keep in mind there aren't a lot of clinical trials yet, but we're hoping that there will be more. Um, and you can either type these in or click the link depending on what's available to you mm -hmm. when you see it. Um, tune in to research news. Um, here's some different resources that, um, that share the latest research. I read Spin Magazine all the time, and there's always a, a research okay. article. Yeah, <laughs> um, and there's always a research article, uh, you know, talking, interviewing a clinician or a researcher about a mm -hmm. new development, um, and coming to events, seminars, cafe scientifique, especially the ones that we're going to support through our consumer engagement strategy. So, uh, there's a plug for me. And, and uh, sorry, just uh, back up there. Uh, some of the other things, like you mentioned, the cafe night. That's also. Um, CIBC. Yeah, so those will also be hosted on online also for uh, Ruth from the UK. So if you're ever interested, it's another format for people to uh, view uh, those topics right. and also to ask questions directly from, in real time. In yeah. real time, directly yeah. from the uh, you know the researchers and scientists that are at I so Yeah. It's another opportunity, and those ones are also um, broadcast through our. The same webinar system and advertised through the different websites like iCord and Spinal Cord Injury BC. Right, and anyone can participate. Yes, um, which is and um, I think that's an underutilized opportunity to ask questions mm -hmm. of our researchers. So we'll try yeah. and make sure to do more of those. Yeah, um, and then support what matters to you. I mean, I've said this before, but create a demand. Um, I can't say enough about Dennis Tesla actually because he knows how to create a demand, and he did, and it mm -hmm. worked. Um, 
the SCI sucks is that example I mentioned, um, the grassroots group that's raising money for research that they care about. Um, and I would love to see um, people with SCI in Canada, um, you know, having grassroots groups that fund the things that are important to them as well. And it's easy to say because a lot of people with SCI have troubles with employment and um, I don't have a lot of money and transportation, and, yeah. but the internet offers us way more options than before. Mm -hmm. And you know, there's always Kickstarter and that sort of thing. Um, and I think we're we're even considering some ways that we could support people in um, fundraising for things that they care about. So, you know, stay tuned. Oh, um, really, one. Um, it's it's an idea, I have <laughs> okay. to say, but okay. it's but that's a, a tough one too. My curiosity on that one. Yeah. I'll tell you more okay, about thanks. it. Um, Off camera. Yeah. <laughs> Adopt the work that's relevant to you. And and that's where that hug a researcher thing comes in. We have a guy who um, some people might know, but we, there's the uh, Physical Activity Resource Center at SCI, or it's partly SCIBC's involved. It's at the Bless and Spinal Cord Center. And it's a really amazing gym. It's all new. It's yeah, all adapted. It's so. fantastic. And you know, there's a guy who comes and he is so involved in it. He he's our sort of biggest cheerleader and mm -hmm. champion, and he's clearly demonstrated what's the most important to him, and he's going to make sure that people know about it. Who's that? Uh, John? Is you know John? Mm -hmm. I don't remember his last name, but um, it's one of those things that, w with that kind of support and mm -hmm. people championing it, w researchers and institutions like RHI draw more attention. And when we draw more attention, we're able to get more funding, which enables us to do our work better. Yeah. So create a demand. Um, I think that is it. So I do welcome anyone to email me. Um, my email's up there. Um, call me. Probably email is probably the best way to do it. Um, and uh, I'll do my best to answer your questions. Um, and I'll try and get some of the information on from the questions that were asked. And um, yeah, I'd, I welcome all questions. I know we don't always agree, but I'm happy to do my best to answer. That'd be kind of boring if we all agree on everything. So, yeah. Um, uh, thanks. Uh, it was, it was a lot of good information. Um, my a job. Lot of very, no. Yeah, yeah. You were even talking. So, what time is it now? Two hours. Oh. It's three. <laughs> is it three o'clock? Yeah. Oh, you're almost over time.